welcome everyone. We are expecting a full house today, so we've got 100 people with us, which will be really exciting. Um, so we'll just give everyone a couple of uh, minutes to, to log on. It's nice to see everyone's very prompt, which is, is great. I think with these things, everyone's kind of waiting for the first, like, the couple of minutes beforehand, whereas when you hold them in real life, everyone kind of, like, sneaks in the back at the last, <laughs> last five minutes. Everybody joins. Yes, hello everybody who's joined so far. Thanks for doing this today. Thanks for your time. Hopefully this will be uh, useful for everyone. Um, and Ashby, we're going to take questions and comments on the chat field, aren't they? Which people yes. need to click on their little more button. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, for those of you that aren't um, super familiar with Zoom and kind of doing these, there should be a chat um, symbol at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll be able to open up a side panel, which you'll then start um, being able to see what other people are writing in there. Um, you can put your own questions in there too. Um, we will come on to questions at the end, but don't feel like you have to wait till the end to add them in. And then we've made the um, presentation interactive, so there will be questions throughout that you you can kind of feed your answers into um so yes use the use the chat function as much as you like oh good morning kerry good to have you with us hey, um, kerry. <laughs> it's nice we won't we won't necessarily name, like shout out everyone and kind of embarrass everyone this morning um but yeah so, so what we'll um do i guess is just wait a couple of minutes or maybe a minute more just to um see as more people join us which means we'll fill with lovely wonderful chat in the meantime um but it's really exciting to um to be hosting this today and i think we've got some really great content which will be lovely to share um so yeah and there um in terms of people so we are expecting 100 which is amazing um, and we had a couple of um last minute dropouts which then the places were refilled straight away from kind of linkedin so um looking very very busy um indeed some people are also um will be sending the link in the chat field and the slides around so afterwards so that's also great so again guys if there's anybody else you know who wants to join today and couldn't do pass on our, um, get them to email us or message either of us on LinkedIn because we'll be able to share the recording and the slides with those people afterwards as well. Exactly. Um, lovely. Okay, well, let's kind of get started. And then as people kind of join, they'll only um, miss the intro bit. Um, so for those of you who haven't worked with with me before, um, I am Ashby. We've got Catherine, which will, who will be to the left or the right of me, um, who will be partnering together to host you today. Um, I, and if you've not worked with Ashby Jenkins Recruitment before, we are traditionally a recruitment agency, which we're not doing loads of at the moment. So we've adapted and, and become created with this. Um, I've been recruiting fundraisers for the last six years and then 18 months ago established Ashby Jenkins Recruitment to offer a real kind of relationship-led approach to recruitment so we work very closely with our clients in terms of obviously finding them great talent but um, advising on kind of structures and job descriptions and things like that it, that was initially recruiting for Catherine's team was how I met her so a testament of that and we also look after innovation and digital roles um, at the moment, obviously, recruitment is on the back burner for so many of you um, because you're in the midst of reforecasting and, and all of that fun stuff. So we've we've shifted our support to try and offer a variety of blogs and webinars to help fundraisers and fundraising leaders navigate during this difficult time period. Um, so this is part of a series, obviously, today with Catherine. Next Thursday, we're hosting a webinar on change management and building resilience, which is targeted probably more at your team members so um, those people that are manager executive officer level if you've, you're concerned about someone in your team um, I'll share the link after this so that you can send it to them and they can they can register for that um, and then also throughout this process we're facilitating peer-to-peer -peer introductions so if you're feeling a little bit isolated as a leader do get in touch with me and we can look at matching you with with someone and, and forging an introduction there um, but this is obviously the today's one that we're part of. So we're delighted to have Catherine Miles with us from Catherine Miles Consulting. For those of you not familiar with Catherine's experience, this is the bit that it gets embarrassing, Catherine, and <laughs> you can blush a little bit. Um, Catherine has been director of fundraising at some amazing organizations um, across the years, including Breast Cancer Now, Battersea, and Anthony Nolan. Uh, it was at Anthony Nolan that she introduced the high kind of groundbreaking and high value 
new approach to community fundraising, which subsequently has been rolled out across the across the sector with a lot of other charities. Um, she's got strong experience of designing fundraising strategies, overseeing mergers, diversifying income, and is a really great pair of um, hands to have on your team, especially at the moment. So um, I'm sure you'll be following up with her anyway, but she's uh, she's a great person to lead with insight. Um, is there anything that I've missed off there, Catherine? I didn't want to embarrass you too much. Oh, no, that's fine. You know, uh, but uh, some things like that are always marvellous, indeed. Um, but also tributes to the teams that I was working with at the time and the supporters there. Um, but yes, with my new consultancy, uh, which obviously has been launched at a perfect time to launch a launch of business right now, but uh, my fundraising consultancy focuses on helping teams grow their income, helping them develop their teams, and of course, right now, lots of focus on how to respond and how best to position your fundraising team to coronavirus. Yeah. Great. And what I what we'll do now, guys, is just I will be sharing my screen. So technology willing, this will all work very smoothly. Has that come up straight away onto our first slide? That looks that's great. Or is that just my view? No, that looks right. We've got our first slide up. Wonderful. Yeah, looks good. Great. OK, so um, this is what we'll be doing. So where next for fundraising post COVID, um, which I'm sure everyone's waiting for with with bated breath. Um, and to do, let me just see whether I can click. This is where it all goes terribly wrong. Give me one second. I'm just going to reshare that because that was uh, interesting. I thought if we get through this completely smoothly, I would be very surprised. I'm normally pretty cursed with technology. Okay, oh. here we go. Okay, so that's where we are, and this is what we're doing in today's session. Hooray! Um, so we're going to be sharing insights, tips, and ideas, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, for those of you that have joined more recently, um, along the bottom of your screen, there is a chat icon. Open that up and feel free to post questions throughout the webinar. We will also have questions on some of our slides that we'd like your input and your answers on, so um, please do get involved with the chat. Um, and we will save the chat stream and send it around post session alongside the slides and a link to recording if you would like to receive that um, and then we've got some useful tips at the at the end to share but uh, we will move on to our next slide so Catherine over to you thank you thanks Ashby and thanks everybody for coming today hope you're all sitting comfortably with a cup of tea coffee and a biscuit you certainly deserve a biscuit if you're a fundraiser right now so obviously we've got a, a massive challenge in our fundraising world and society generally at the moment um, and it's a big challenge for the charities we work for, our beneficiaries and for us as fundraisers and particularly for those of you where you've had team members furloughed and you're, you know, you're covering multiple roles. But ironically we've also got a great opportunity right now to talk to our supporters like us, they're at home, they're online, they're opening posts, they're picking up their phones and I think what's really important to hang on to right now as particularly as you look at your budget numbers coming down is that your donors didn't decide to stop giving or fundraising for your charity coronavirus is preventing them from supporting you in the way they want to so it's stopping them around the marathon holding that bake sale supporting through their company um, so the donors still want to give and we're seeing huge evidence of that across the sector about how people are responding to this and it's crucial that as fundraisers, we are out there fundraising and asking. It's really, really important we're doing that right now. And we're looking creatively as possible about how we adapt to these new environments to enable our supporters to give. So there is hope and we all need to keep fundraising. <laughs> that's true I think a lot of people at the moment have been um, or a lot of the directors I'm speaking to are kind of getting to that stage where it's like oh when will this be over and feeling a little bit of, of hate business so good to, good to hear there's uh, there's positive things to be thinking about indeed indeed there is but start on the negative points so we know lots of charities are significantly forecasting income down in 2020 and those of you who are budgeting for 2021 also as well are a lot of you are looking at much much lower numbers than you're expecting to be at next year it's important to note that the situation isn't the same for every charity. It depends on your fundraising mix. So what we're seeing is significant impact on fundraising that relies on physical and social contact and interaction. So challenge events, special events, cancelled and postponed. Most traditional community fundraising is at a standstill pretty much. So bag packs, bucket collections, cake sales, and of course, the big area of acquisition for us as a sector, face-to-face -face regular giving pretty much paused in the UK. We're also seeing that initial reaction to the economic shock. So there was initially some increase in regular giving attrition from the stats um, coming out from rapid data. Although again, it's important to note 
the position is individual for each charity on that on the on the attrition and the retention rates and also it's very very early on in that data for us to be able to see what's happening with regular giving but what we do know also is there's been an immediate sharp reduction in corporate giving particularly amongst in corporate employee fundraising because as we know so many companies are really facing an existential threat right now seeing significant reductions in their revenue and their turnover or are just almost at a standstill um, so lots of impacts uh, for us to be grappling with right now as a sector and as i said the charity seeing the big impacts are those that have got the large chunks of their money for it coming from community events corporate yeah it's um it's it's difficult especially for those charities that do rely heavily on those retail partnerships or hospitality partnerships where there are those big charity of the years that obviously they, those options are um going to be changed massively for the the future um and how how are donors reacting to, to the situation now yeah, what we're seeing is overwhelmingly is the giving public want to help. And this is this is very consistent, right, about how the world and the UK responds. People tend to respond to crises with altruism. So we saw that with the tsunami with Grenfell. So we've seen fantastic fundraising, obviously bigger so far, the wonderful Colonel Tom now, 32 million. <laughs> And what's interesting about that is 1.3 million people gave on that Just Giving page. So this really is mass giving. Um, 67 million pounds raised by BBC Big Night In um, and 9 million so far on the 2.6 challenge. So donors want to help, they want to give. And there's some great donor research going on by Blue Frog at the moment. And we've got the link to that podcast at the end of this session. And that's really worth 30 minutes of your time to listen to. They were researching when the crisis hit and they've kept the interviews going with donors across a range of causes. And what's coming out loud and clear is people want to keep giving. They want to keep giving to the causes they care about, but they also want to support coronavirus related causes. So those are both the obvious ones, NHS charities, food banks, vaccine research. But donors also understand there's a wider knock-on effect happening here. So straight away in the interviews, donors were talking about, well, this is probably going to lead to delays in cancer diagnosis, isn't it? There's going to be issues on treatment for other diseases. There's going to be massive increases to calls to charity helplines. So our donors understand this has lots of different ramifications for different causes. And they want to give. Um, and they want to be able to help and make a difference. And of course, as we know, giving makes people feel good. In this circumstance, it makes people feel like they're doing something positive, it can be fun for them, it's a way of people exerting a bit of control under a, an uncertain situation. And what we're then seeing is that, that people really want to work out how they can essentially use some of their disposable income right now. So if you think about, I suppose, all of our lives, some of us, a lot of us actually do have a bit more disposable income right now because we're not going out spending on meals, we're not going on holidays, we're not driving our cars as much. And if you think about the typical donor profile and the socioeconomic groups those people are in, they actually have quite a bit of disposable income, um, which is available to give to charity. And of course, traditionally, most charity donors are not in the socioeconomic groups who are most affected by economic downturns. Now, of course, the big caveat here is, this economic shock may be different. This may be so extensive. And we saw the figures yesterday, 25% of jobs in the UK are being furloughed, which is staggering when you think the government is now paying for a quarter of the workforce. Yeah. But traditionally, charity donors, the individual donors are resilient during recessions and keep giving. Um, so it's important for us to remember that and hold on to that. Yeah. So what we did here, actually, our first point was be a bit of an opportunity for the chat question. And if you're posting the chat field, do choose the option which says um, delegates and participants and everyone. It's the everyone option so everybody can see. So it'd be really interesting to know from people what reactions are you seeing or hearing from your donors? What have you seen so far? Yeah, I think you make really interesting points there, Catherine, because there's I, I definitely I'm talking through my my journey through uh, Corona. The first two weeks were obviously terrifying and like a roller coaster of emotion. I mean, it's still a roller coaster of emotion, but, um, you know, I think you automatically start worrying about your money and things like that. And a lot of those charities did start seeing cancellations or the option to take payment breaks on regular gifts. Whereas I think we've now reached that point where most people are recognizing actually, yes, I am saving money on eating out or 
your cars or transport as you as you've mentioned what can we do with that and particularly you you obviously mentioned local causes there um i come from a hospice fundraising background so does one of my team i know that those kind of calls are so um central to the local community and obviously that a lot of them are, are really struggling so it's it's hopeful to see that more people are still still thinking of giving and supporting yeah, absolutely. And I think it is it is that thing, isn't there, about we know how generous the public are. We can see how they're reacting to all sorts of initiatives. And a lot of those initiatives at the moment are not actually being driven by the charity sector. It's very interesting. There's celebrity-driven fundraising that people are giving to. Um, there's other organisations starting to come to the fore. So I think we can see, they see the appetite is there. Mm. And it's how do we adjust our mechanics and our channels and our activity to best take advantage of those opportunities. I should also say there's an update to that Blue Frog research that's due out today. Um, so again, we'll make sure we share the link to that because it is a really interesting study. Yeah. And we've had a couple of people comment so at, with really positive stuff actually saying a lot um, and I think we're going to come on to this later the high value trust and foundation side is, is being really good a lot of generosity across across that area but concerns like from from people here that it might start to wane as we kind of move on through towards the end of the financial year and obviously um, we've had someone touch on the challenge events in the autumn season. I know you're going to touch on that now so tell me if you don't want to talk about that at the moment but in terms of the the challenge events what, what would you advise organizations are starting to look at yeah i'll um i'll go on and one of the things i should sort of explain to people is one of the things i've been doing over the last few weeks is holding free zoom calls with groups of fundraising directors to share how, what impact are they seeing on their charities what do we think some of the ideas and solutions might be how do we all adjust this new environment and people have been great on those calls really willing to share and i'm going to be doing more of them over future weeks and if anybody on the webinar would like to join one do just message me afterwards it'd be brilliant to get you on there they happen every week um and so certainly i did one with heads of challenge events um last week um, I think essentially my take on that is I think it is unlikely the big third party challenge events will happen this autumn. Obviously, those race directors, events directors haven't made their final decisions yet and are waiting for government advice. I think it is going to be really unlikely it's going to be OK in terms of the hotel accommodation runners need for those events, the public transport, the amount of stewards and volunteers, the amount of crowds that come and watch. I think it is really unlikely those big third party events are going to be back this autumn. So I think we are probably looking more like the challenge event season coming back in 2021, if possible, which of course means that things to have a think about in your charity is if you've got big challenge events programs, do you think that's going to be the case? How do you potentially defer participants who signed up for 2020 on to 2021? Because of course, you don't want to essentially have to then spend a whole year's marketing and acquisition budget to get another whole number of participants onto the 2021 event. If you can hold on to people and transfer them across, that would be brilliant. And of course, they'll raise more and they'll remit at a higher level because they've already started fundraising for you, particularly the marathon runners. Because of course, when the shutters came down for all of us, it was not that far away from the race. So they were pretty far advanced with their fundraising. So I think my best guess at the moment would be it's not going to come back substantially in the autumn so you're probably looking at deferrals and trying to maximize the 2021 events yeah okay great and um obviously the i think the really key thing for us to stay focused on with anything is to be optimistic with a sense of realism well, that's that's key but what where are the key opportunities across funding in the in the next kind of 12 to 24 months that you see yeah, so we're seeing two, two ph phenomena, really. Opportunities that people are coming up with in response to lockdown and social isolation, um, and then uplift on existing activity because people are at home. So we've seen some great virtual fundraising, um, and then great stuff in terms of isolation, do your own thing fundraising. So the garden, back, the backyard half marathons. So a great example to have a look at on um, some of the virtual fundraising. Haven House did a brilliant Zoom quiz hosted by their patron, Ben Shepherd. They had 325 teams playing, people donated to play and made donations throughout. And you can have a look on their Twitter feed, which is at Haven House CH, because it was a really nice example about how to do a Zoom quiz. And other charities have got those working really, really well across the sector as well. And it's also worth having a look at worldinaday.com. This is Mark Beaumont, who's the round the world cyclist. 
And what he's done on Zwift, which people might be familiar with, Zwift is a virtual reality platform where if you've got a bike mounted on a turbo at home, you can cycle along and pick any route around the world and you can cycle in group rides. So of course, all the passionate cyclists out there were on Zwift anyway, doing their lockdown exercise. So what Mark has done is set up a weekly ride. People want to ride with him because he's a great cyclist and he picks an amazing global route. And you sign up and do the mileage you want and you would do donate a pound per mileage and you ride with Mark. And it takes place on a 24 hour loop so he can pick people up globally. So in their first week, they raised 140,000 pounds. And this is now gonna be weekly. So it's that really clever idea of go where your donors are, take add a fundraising element to what people are doing anyway during lockdown. Um, and that links, of course, to the gaming community. So gamers, huge increase in the time they've got available online. Uh, my best friend's son has pretty much gone nocturnal and disappeared <laughs> into his bedroom. Uh, but he, apparently he's very good at gaming. Um, and what we know is that gaming community is really willing to do things for charity. So either do your own thing gaming um, or actually gamers setting up live streams and responding to challenges. So we actually were testing a gaming product at Battersea while I was there. And we certainly saw really encouraging, encouraging results from our pilot, particularly from the live stream. And it is a community that really does want to engage with us. So there's an opportunity to tap into that. Yeah. And yes, sorry, go for it. Sorry, Catherine, I was just going to say on gaming, it's an interesting one because I think it's a lot of, um, a lot of charities have been really risk averse to the lack of control that you can have, uh, the lack of perceived control that you can have around gaming, which I think this uh, COVID is really pushing organisations into maybe taking a bit more risk and a bit more chance that it can be really rewarding. Um, if anyone is interested in how their charity can use gaming, do get in touch with me afterwards because I can put you in contact with a really great guy um, called Tom who works for one of the leading gaming organisations and um, I can Again, to give you advice and tips on, on how to make it work for your organization. Absolutely, and certainly our experience at Bastion was the gamers were completely understa understanding about the idea of reputational risk and what was appropriate and what wasn't. They totally understand and they know. Um, so yes, I wouldn't, wouldn't we'd be less worried about that. The other thing to remember is the profile of gamers is a lot older than people think it is. Lots of people think it's just teenagers in their bedrooms and it really isn't. Um, so, so it's much, much more in people in their 30s and 40s. Um, so yes, as we touched on earlier, we're seeing the usual fantastic response from the charitable trust sector. So emergency grant funds set up, new grants programmes, and really importantly, more flexibility on grant criteria and reporting, which is of course really important for those of you with big levels of restricted funding, projects that might be being delayed and not able to happen or need to happen in a different way. And I think as ever, the trust sector has stepped up brilliantly in this area and is being very, very sensible and flexible and working with its grantees. What we're also seeing, interestingly, in the first few weeks of the crisis particularly, was a big increase in people making their wills in the UK. Now, of course, Legacy marketing always has to be approached sensitively by charities, but it is really interesting that the public are choosing to do this anyway and are going online, making wills online, talking to solicitors via Zoom. And there is an opportunity there for your charities to talk about being remembered in those wills. So it is something to think about. I know as well there's been lots of discussion within particular charities, again, about risk and concerns around that. But I think it's important always to trust our donors and treat them like adults. They are choosing to make their own wills. They are choosing to make those decisions right now. So there are opportunities for conversations about including your charity in those. Yeah, and I think, oh sorry Catherine, just in terms of, and obviously this is a slightly outside, sitting on the outside of the sector looking in, but I think you you wouldn't see it in another sector where actually people are doing a massive, kind of following a massive new trend, to want mm -hmm. a better word, and an organisation that can benefit from that and not tapping into that market, mm -hmm. it would be really unusual. And I think, um, you know, particularly I would urge like fundraising directors who you've probably spent years trying trying to integrate your legacy teams into your community teams, into your corporate teams, major gifts, saying and advocating that actually having this legacy conversations are not a dirty, it's not a dirty topic, it's not something to be ashamed of. And if you pull back on all your legacy activity now, you really undermine your existing legacy teams um, mm -hmm. and all the messaging that you've been spending kind of years building. 
you know, I think it's it's obviously a sensitive subject, but um, but the, the similar with face to face fundraising. You know, I spoke to one of my um, charities recently and uh, they pulled back on all of their legacy activity because they had a handful of complaints. And it's the same thing with face to face. You're always going to get a, a small number of complaints, but the return on investment in the long term surely outweighs that. Absolutely right. And I think, again, it comes back to trusting our supporters. Um, our supporters are adults. They understand about having these sorts of conversations. And actually, yeah, in this legacy things, they're going there themselves. They're choosing to do this. This is how they are reacting to the crisis. And, you know, it's, it's not an illogical thing to do, to make sure to do make your world right now. It really is not. So there is certainly that opportunity there. Um, what we're also seeing is uplift on existing channels. So particularly those where people are at home and engaging with them. So increased context and response rates on DRTV, telemarketing, direct mail, digital regular giving and lottery acquisition. I've been talking to some of the big DRTV agencies on some pre-existing campaigns. So these are the normal DRTV ads, not specific coronavirus appeal ads. They're seeing uplifts of up to 50% on performance of all their charity clients. So that's very, very interesting. Um, so again, it's worth thinking about, can you scale up in those channels? Are some of those channels ones you've tried before and found them not to give, give a good return on investment for your charity, but they may be worth retesting in this environment? Um, and also the charities that have done specific emergency appeals, whether that's across all channels, are seeing good responses to those. Um, so again, I think the message is people, people want to give. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, on that, it would be good to get um, everyone's insight into what innovative or creative fundraising your supporters have done. If there's something really crazy um, that you don't mind sharing, that would be lovely. It's always good to good to have inspiration. Um, I'm sure there's been some some wacky stuff happening um, and good to hear from Ben around um, legacy giving at his organisation. So they've had more interest in um, people making wills and things like that. So that's um, that kind of is true to the point that we'd we'd mentioned um perfect i saw someone doing like on linkedin the other day about like i think it was a thousand squats i don't know how anyone has thighs that strong it's just ridiculous um but keep those <laughs> keep, that's just been my personal opinion but keep um keep those coming in those suggestions that's great um and we'll move on to the next slide so what's the external environment going to be for the next 12 months what have, what have your round tables come up with Catherine? Indeed. So, I mean, I think unsurprisingly, we're looking probably at the new normal going for two to three years, maybe not just 12 months. So we're obviously going to be seeing continued social distancing in the UK and continued working from home. And that's for our supporters and also ourselves in charities. And if you actually look at what the government is talking about, regulations that employers would have to do. So taping space in lifts, having people sat side by side, not facing one another in the offices, not being able to use canteens. I think there's going to be an awful lot of employers which will look at those regulations and go, it's much simpler to keep people working from home if they possibly can. Um, what I think we will also see is this phenomenon of even as the regulations loosen, we'll all make value judgments about what level of social interaction, particularly with mass numbers of people, we're willing to do. And we're going to take a risk reward assessment. So I really do think even if the lockdown is eased, we'll see our supporters making judgments about, do they feel comfortable going to a friend's house for a charity coffee morning? Do they want to come into central London to go to a black tie gala event sat in a room with 300 people? Are they comfortable cheering at the marathon? And I think, again, we are gonna see, all of us will be making those individual decisions on how do we judge the risk? How do we judge the precautions that we're being advised to take? And what are we willing to do and so I think we have to be really mindful of that when we're thinking about those channels with physical interactions. So I do not believe we are suddenly in the UK going to see a lessening of the lockdown and everything goes back to normal, even in you know September, October time. I just don't think we are going back to normality. I mean, the government, God help us, are sort of like leaking that you know the pubs may be closed until Christmas. I mean, this is this is a terrible, <laughs> terrible prospect for us all. So you know, what an earth will fundraisers do on a Friday night? Dear God, we may go home at a decent time. Um, but but if you think about that, and you think at the moment how alien it might be to jump on a crowded tube set and go off and cheer at the marathon, I just 
I suspect people are not going to do those things. Mm. As we said, we know there's going to be a significant economic downturn. The billion dollar question for us as a sector is what does that do to individual giving um, attrition? But we know there's going to be impacts on companies. And we also know we are going to be dealing with lots of companies doing restructures, redundancies. Um, so I think there's, um, there's a, a lot of different ramifications there that we have to watch very closely to see how they'll play out. We're also likely to see further waves of lockdown. So this virus is obviously likely to reoccur. It's likely to mutate. And these could be national lockdowns. These could be regional lockdowns. And of course, with the text um, apps and tracing, what they're going to do is, if you get alerted that you've been in the vicinity of someone who's then been diagnosed with coronavirus, you'll be required to strictly isolate for 14 days. So I suspect what you'll all see is, your supporters suddenly having to go back into lockdown for 14 days, your staff teams suddenly people come coming in and out. And of course, you know, if you live with a family, live with a shared house, presumably if your partner gets one of these alert messages that they need to isolate, do you need to isolate too? So I think we're going to see a lot of staccato um, of things being loosened and then tightened. We do have the advantage that we're three weeks ahead of Europe. So um, yesterday, face-to-face -face fundraising came back in Europe, um, in Norway and in Germany. It starts again today. Um, and there's some really interesting photographs about how um, the private site teams have adjusted what they're actually doing physically on the ground to be able to do that um, in line with their government's guidance. So I think it's going to be very interesting and we're going to have to track really carefully as things come back, how do people actually react? Not just what the measures are, it's what do people actually do. Yeah. yeah Catherine, is there, um, was there a source particularly that you saw that about the um, Nor Norway and Germany coming back to face face? Because I know someone in the questions put that they'd be interested to um, see how they would so safely resume that. Yes, there's a couple of um, a global face-to-face -face, um, experts on LinkedIn who have been posting um, some of the early photos. I mean, I will share it um, afterwards on my LinkedIn feed. Um, so at Catherine Miles, unsurprisingly. Um, so, so what they've got is those Perspex face visors, not um, the dark uh, masks. Um, they've got gloves on and they are standing in a socially distanced manner on their private sites. Um, little rig up. So they've obviously gone for the Perspex visors so people can see their faces um, and, and interact in that way. And then they've got the iPads and they've clearly got an awful lot of antibacterial equipment that they're clearly you know, wiping things with. Everyone is smiling in the photos. Whether they're getting any sign ups, of course, is another thing, <laughs> but they are, they are back out there on the streets. So it's going to be very interesting to see how does that respond in Europe and what do people do? Yeah, it's just the new normal, isn't it? I think that's it. It's the hardest thing is is dealing with the change initially and also the uncertainty. And uh, I suppose once we get used to that, we'll be used to seeing everyone through Perspex <laughs> and moving forward. Um, but no, it's interesting. I think when, when we were first speaking last week and you were saying, well, there will definitely be other waves of lockdown. I was like, oh no, I'd <laughs> I'm almost done with this one, like please. Um, so fundraising over the next 12 months, that's obviously the question that I'm sure everyone will have on the tip of their tongue there we go um so let's go through kind of what you think's on the up what you think's on the chat on the down let's have a let's have a look yeah so things on the left are the ones where i think streams will do better um or potentially there'll be some growth things on the right the streams that i think will be uh, facing our challenges and of course it is divided into that how much face-to-face -face physical interaction does there have to be so i think the areas where we'll see growth is those channels, as we talked about earlier, where there's higher response rates right now. So DRTV, telemarketing, digital acquisition. I think some of the virtual fundraising that we've seen is going to stick and people are going to keep doing it because they like it. So I think it's worth thinking about mm -hmm. how you develop and grow your virtual do your own thing offer and support a journey. So things like the Zoom quizzes, I think groups of friends are going to keep doing those. I also think there's going to be big demand for the third party challenge events when they come back, because there's going to be a lot of pent up demand for people to run the big races. <laughs> but I also think do your own thing, run walks and cycles will come up because I think people will feel potentially comfortable doing things with their friendship group locally. And I think it picks up on that trend where definitely, as you said, there's been a surge in lockdown of people getting into various types of physical activity. So again, it's worth thinking about, have you got a do your own thing, run walks and treks product um, and support a journey? Uh, and if not, is that something you could develop? 
I think there are going to be opportunities for major donors. I think both the major donors that are very close to your charities, wanting to understand the impact on you and wanting to help. And I've seen that with charities that I've been working with, but also those major donors who want to have a big issue, big impact on a global issue. So those major donors who really want to affect transformational change, those major philanthropists, as you can see with Gates Foundation switching, it's almost its entire operations onto the vaccine search. There is going to be nothing bigger in the world than potentially being the philanthropist that funds the successful vaccine trial. So that is going to attract some of these guys. Um, I think as well, there will be some... Oh, there we go. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> um, I, think, I think as well, as I said, there will be an ongoing opportunity around legacy marketing. So the areas where I think it's going to be more difficult, um, those ones with the physical interaction. So special events. And again, not only that sense of people going to feel comfortable coming back into the room, but also the impact on companies' ability to sponsor and buy tables. I think those mass participation events, which focus in on workplaces, schools, socialising again, this issue about the extent of social distancing and people just not, either not being allowed to be together or not being comfortable to be together. Now, there are opportunities to flex mass participation onto virtual digital platforms, but the most important thing is no fundraising can automatically convert from being a physical activity into a digital activity. Digital fundraising works in a very, very specific way. You need expert advice, which often is to be found in agencies as well as in your in-house teams. And it's really important not just to try to plonk something you're doing online. So there are opportunities to do digital and virtual mass participation events, but you need the expert advice. Yeah. Um, and again, as we talked about community fundraising, again, I think is going to be tricky. Um, um, there's been a dramatic reduction in the use of cash in the UK, because again, people are worried about the virus being transmitted on coins. But I think there we have an opportunity to really take advice and problem solve together with our supporters. So I'm sure for everyone, your community fundraising volunteers, their commitment to fundraising for you will still be there. They will be desperate and itching to get back out there and doing something. So there's opportunities right now while everyone is home for you to speak to them on the phone, arrange Zoom calls, get their ideas about what do they think is going to work in their local community based on the fundraising they've always done for you. What do they think will come back and people be comfortable to do? What new ideas have they got? Because as we know, our donors are endlessly creative, but particularly our community fundraising but donors are endlessly creative and they will have ideas about how to adjust. So it's really important right now that we're talking to the people who've raised lots of money for us over a number of years in the community and putting our heads together to come up with solutions. Mm. Interesting. I think as well in terms of, I mean, one of the things over the years of community fundraising is obviously those traditional volunteer led community, um, community committees and things like that. It's more difficult to get them to commit time and, and, and the younger generation are tending not to give in that way. So potentially this kind of situation where it does push us to be more digital and more innovative, we can tap into new markets for community fundraising that we've perhaps not um, kind of gone after before or who had kind of traditionally just sat in like gaming or digital on that side of things yeah absolutely um yeah and again again as we were talking about in terms of face-to-face -face regular giving acquisition I think the agencies will come back and try and test it see if it can make it work i think we will see significantly reduced acquisition volumes as they do that um, and as they adjust i think there will be high demand from charities for those volumes i think they will find a way of continuing to make it work but it's going to be at much much smaller volumes and i suspect that is going to go into 2021 as well um, and as a result i think as well we'll see peaks and troughs in those volumes as the lockdowns come in and they have to stop again um, so i think it will be possible um, but it's going to be at smaller volumes to begin with and everyone is going to have to test and find a way of making making that work and seeing how the public are, are responsive and then there's a couple where i think it's too early to tell so i think it's too early to tell about regular giving attrition we need more months data what is always the case is it's so important to focus on on your retention and your support journey and your supporter experience with all of your donors but particularly your regular givers and again there's been figures around potential drops in legacy income due to collapse in the housing market lower stock markets and delays in house sales I think that's possible but again i think it's too early to tell right now we are actually i know it feels like this has been going on forever but we are actually still in the early weeks of this 
Um, so I think that needs to be monitored closely. But again, our experience from 2008 was that legacies did slow up when the housing market slowed up, but then the value over time continued to grow. So we may see delays, but hopefully that income will, will hold up. Right. And I think a couple of people have just been writing in the comment and Rachel said something interesting as well around corporate um, corporate giving. So the and everyone, sorry, if the screen keeps popping up with chat and then removing or I keep switching slides. It's because I'm trying to multitask. Um, but it's it's true. There's whilst those kind of traditional retail or um, travel partnerships might not be in existence in the future, there will be new opportunities. I mean, when um, one of my friends works in education technology and they are hiring massively at the moment because they cannot keep up with demand. Um, so I think there will be new opportunities. It's just it's really hard to take off what you've known to be successful in the formula that's worked for you up until this point and think actually let's rewrite now what we look at but the longer that you spend focusing on what's happened in the past the slower you'll be to to get in with those new corporates that that will have the potential to grow from this e-commerce is another area she mentioned mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And we saw that very early on, didn't we, where we saw some of those big supermarket charity partnerships, people like Aldi, people like Tesco's, doing very big upfront charitable donations at the start because they knew, of course, their revenue has shot up. Um, they, you know, as ever, there are some companies that are, are reaping benefits from this, um, that are seeing upsurges in sales. And so there are opportunities from those. Um, so we had a further chat question for everyone. Thank you for everyone posting in the chat. It's really great. Which income streams do you think will do better over the next 12 months? and which are gonna do worse or face the most challenges. So what's gonna come through the best and what's gonna find it most difficult? Um, and interestingly around kind of the I was we've been speaking to a few heads of digital in the last kind of week or so just to get their insight and I, I know someone's Julian's written about um, digital fundraising in the space and we'll, we'll come on to that question at the end because I think that's a really interesting one but they they were saying those kind of old school methods like radio which we've seen massive decline mm -hmm. in over the years in terms of the effectiveness of, of advertising on there for regular givers and now like people are starting to invest in that area so there's um, it's funny how some of the really old old fashioned ways of, of recruiting new donors is, is coming back into into fruition. Um, we always find a way, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> somewhere we'll get them. If they're in the homes, we'll get them somewhere. I did think that they're gonna start being built more billboards put up in parks because obviously everyone's walking around those areas and <laughs> exactly. direct, direct mail is the channel that always refuses to die. I've said I don't know how many times in my career I've seen the direct mail has had it this time. Like no, no, and it's back again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, um, I guess the uh, kind of key one is how do people best position their fundraising programme? Um, so Catherine, how, how would you advise? Yes, I think the first most important thing is doing nothing is not an option, but it's really important not to panic and knee jerk. So you have to react, your organisation has to react to this. Um, and a second major thing is to have a think about, which is very tricky for us all to work through at the moment, is to what extent is this potentially contraction in the physical social interaction fundraising channels for a six month period or this year and then everything comes back to normal or to what extent is this a much much bigger structural shift in the sector and again i think we are slightly too soon to tell on that but we need to be thinking about that so i think first thing is if your charity is directly or indirectly impacted on coronavirus make sure you are developing and sharpening your coronavirus case for support donors want to support this they want to give generally they want to give to charities that are impacted by coronavirus so make sure you're getting those messaging out there Secondly, as always, prioritise your warm supporters, those are the ones most likely to stay with us, most likely to increase their gifts. So really looking at those stewardship journeys, your supporter experience. And there's been some great examples I've seen of charities using the new virtual channels to communicate and do support experience. So a number of charities have done Zoom calls with their chief exec and their big donors doing a Q&A um, on how coronavirus is impacting on the charity. There's been great stuff where um, expert staff have done webinars on their areas and some of their behind their scenes work. There's also ideas we can, in true fundraising fashion, steal from other sectors. So if you go on the Tate's social media feeds, the Royal Gallery, the Royal Academy's social media feeds, they've done great virtual tours of exhibitions, including exhibitions, their big hits exhibitions from years ago. 
So what content can you bring out? I also personally really um, have quite an obsession with Chester Zoo's Facebook feed because they do live behind the scenes Facebook um, tours when they're feeding the animals. So there's lots of opportunities there for us to, to use the virtual channels to give great support for experience. And of course, as we know, every touch point helps you retain a donor. Then it's a massive opportunity to review what is working and what isn't in your fundraising programme. So there's an opportunity here to look at what was the net income before, what was actually producing a good return on investment, what was proving the best use of every pound and hour you have available to invest in fundraising. And is this an opportunity to move away from activity that wasn't producing the best return on investment anyway, and then particularly, potentially really is not going to work well in this new environment. So I think there's an opportunity for fundraising teams to really look closely about on their paused activity, what do they bring back and what don't they? What does their balance of income streams need to be? And do they potentially need to try to change their fundraising mix, rebalance their portfolio and start to shift focus into the higher return areas? Mm. Linked to that, I think we're all going to have to budget and forecast on a range of scenarios. There's just too many uncertainties right now to produce one definitive set of figures. And I think it is helpful for your finance teams and your chief execs to understand this is what it might look like if challenge events don't come back till 2021. This is what it might look like if regular giving attrition increases. This is what it might look like if we find a vaccine and we are back to pretty much normal in 2021. So I think it's important for charities to understand the range of possible fundraising results they might be seeing. Um, I think whatever your charity decides to do and how it decides to respond, you're going to need to build your digital capacity and expertise. And this can be in-house, agency, combination of both. And again, I think that main point of digital fundraising is specialist expertise and you really really need to listen to the experts um, I know a number of number of them digital experts will be slightly tearing their hair out about something they've some things they've seen they've seen some great stuff they've seen some lots of great stuff so you need the advice um, and fundraising using digital channels is not necessarily the same as other marketing through digital channels um, so you may have a digital in-house team that doesn't necessarily mean they have the fundraising expertise in digital so you need that advice um, and then linked to all of this is looking potentially at skills audits of your fundraising team so when you've got an idea of what direction you're going to move in which areas you're really going to prioritize and focus on is have you got the skills and experience in your fundraising team to do that where might you have gaps where might actually you have great fundraisers who do have those skills but they're currently in another role or in another team um, so you might need to move people around and of course you may need to bring in new skills and experience and recruit in and bring in you and i think that skills audit is actually going to be really really important looking at who you've got in your team um, and then potentially who you need um, and i think overall and this is always going to be a big challenge for our sector. It's not something we do well. We're going to have to be more nimble and flexible and we're going to have to be faster in our decision making. And I'm sure a lot of you probably in those first few weeks just spent constant hours in Zoom senior management and management calls where it was taking time to get the decisions that needed to be done. And as I said, we're not we are not brilliant at fast, efficient decision making in the charity sector. So but we need to try and get better at that quickly because this is evolving very, very fast. And at the moment, in some areas, the donors have been ahead of us. So if you look at how the backyard challenges started, the virtual do your own thing, supporters started doing it. They went and found NHS charities. NHS charities is, was at that stage being run by three people. And I see this explosion of interest. People just went and found them and started raising loads of money for them. So I think there is a real importance here of us upping our speed of decision making and responding to this. I think as well I mean and I mentioned I said this earlier I think it's when you've gone about doing things in a certain way for such a long way it's natural to grieve a little bit for what you've lost and you know there's no doubt that actually if last year your fundraising team had just had a huge growth and you know everything's going to work out to be even better this year that's not that's not possible anymore you need to look and, and accept that but there are new decide on a new win and, and new goals are possible it doesn't you don't have to focus on what was before um, and I think that will speed up decision making as well in in the process um, but in terms of digital capacity it's really interesting 
we, as I said, we've been speaking to a lot of kind of heads of digital and things like that. And it, when you're recruiting for these roles, it's so important that your digital team, the ones that you've got in house or digital fundraising are wrapping around the whole organization. Any charities that I think really struggle with a siloed structure at the moment, uh, it's going to, it's going to hinder your progress and your ability to pick up on this. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. So next thing, we've got some, some helpful tips and links um, on the next slide. Um, so these are hopefully things that you can, we'll be sending the slides to you afterwards. So yeah. there's some things here. So that second one there, that's the donor research I was talking to, which will take you to that 30 minute podcast and some other great examples of fundraising that's been going on. And also, as I said, if you are interested in doing one of those Zoom calls, they've been really great and really interesting to be on. You can email me at cmilesconsulting at outlook.com, which would be great to have you on those calls. We're going to be doing more with directors, but also more on individual areas. So we're going to be doing one on mass participation, one on individual giving, regular giving acquisition. So the this specific thing about how does face-to-face -face come back um, and also one coming up next week on major donors and philanthropy which should be always a good chat so I think now we'll take questions we'll have the yes. ones so I should just stop sharing so we should be able to see Catherine and I and as she said we will send around the slides so don't worry if you've missed those uh, those details or those links um, so I guess a couple of questions and I know they're coming through now but just um, one on digital fundraising Catherine so um, one Julian mentioned that the fund, digital fundraising space will become really crowded how do smaller organizations cut through that or kind of um, embrace that yeah, and I think that's really true. I think I expect to see there's going to be, well, we've already seen a plethora of emergency appeals and then virtual do your own thing. And then we're probably going to see another wave of virtual events this autumn. Um, I think the key thing is to really understand your supporters and your cause. I think it's key to understand what sort of virtual fundraising might work well with your supporters and develop something that is gives them flexibility if it's going to be a do your own thing virtual product but also really does tap into what you know about them um, and also to really have a look at where there might be wider initiatives that you can piggyback on so i think the 2.6 challenge was helpful for everyone as a focal point um, because there was media coverage of it it was an easy concept for charities to pick up and communicate to their supporters so I think there's an interesting thing for us as a sector about whether the sector potentially can come together um, and look at whether it can create some more of those giving moments throughout the rest of this calendar year because that collective focus does seem to help people piggyback on the back of and it's something that's actually that's come up in some of the fundraising director zoom calls I've been doing particularly the ones with a very large charities about whether there could be something that we could look at collectively as a sector around that so that could be an interesting thing potentially for IOF to have a look at for example. Right. And as uh, Lottie's mentioned, which I think is something on a lot of people's minds, and we've definitely heard some interesting stories over the last month or so around furloughing staff. So how do charities balance the short term income issues and the need to furlough alongside keeping fundraising? Yeah, I think furlough has been a massive challenge for the sector. And I think it's understandable when some charities are looking at extremely serious financial figures that there's been a focus on short term cost recovery, if you like, on the salaries. My personal view is a lot of teams in fundraising have, o have over furloughed and have taken out staff, which has then mean the fundraisers that are left have been really swamped. And particularly as a senior fundraisers, they found it very hard to get the time and the headspace to really look at these sort of discussions about strategically, how do they need to respond to this? How do they reposition? Because they're all running around doing three or four jobs and getting exhausted. Um, and also as well, that vital thing right now about this has never been more important to do supporter retention and experience and look after your supporters. And I know a lot of the teams have been furloughed to the extent where it's very, very difficult for them to have enough fundraisers to be able to do that sort of supporter retention work let alone any supporter insight work so i know it's incredibly difficult i think key messages for organizations are always about trying to show talk about the fact that fundraising is always defined as being a long-term activity the decisions you make now will determine how much money your charity has in 2021 2022 2023 and actually if you can't get enough of your fundraisers back in the right areas this will have a really serious impact on 2021 income in particular and i know it's hard for finance directors right now but it is that sense of these are the people we need back and we need them fundraising or we can actually have bigger problems next year so I think trying to talk about 
define the long-term impact for the finance teams and the cost benefit of bringing certain fundraisers back will be really important and also as well again if you look at the news today you know the governments are not going to do a cliff edge on furloughing but they are going to start to wind it down because they can't afford it um so again it's it's going to start coming away Mm. And I think it's one of the things that so we've I've been attending a few different virtual um, fundraising conferences. A question that keeps coming up is, uh, should is now the time for charities to use the reserves? And it seems obvious. <laughs> you know, that's what, what else are they for? Well, quite. I mean, so I don't know how many conversations I've had with boards over the years about what the reserves policy should be and what scenarios should use your reserves in. This is it. This isn't the rainy day. This is the monsoon. This is exactly when you should be using your reserves. And again, those need to be used judiciously. Obviously, it can't be a sense of just money going everywhere. Stock markets are down. So rightly, people will be worried about realising investment portfolios right now when values are lows. But yes, this is what reserves were designed to do now of course some charities are not in the position where they have big reserves and also as well some charities are facing very big cash flow issues mm. i think the other thing about furloughing is some charities have furloughed not actually for financial reasons but because they've got a perception that some teams aren't busy and again i think i think that's probably not the right way to look at it particularly certainly not for fundraising teams and probably also for comms teams as well i think there is a sense of actually you know you you need your hands on deck and even if those people are not able to actively deliver certain activities as planned right now they need to be thinking about and preparing for how does the organization come back into the fundraising market as strongly as possible Interesting. And um, just one last question, just checking on the time. Um, so what kind of expertise would you recommend turning to for delivering successful virtual events in place of special events? Mm. I think best to actually start. There are some very good in-house teams. I think there's a lot of very good agencies out there. Um, I would also not start from the assumption that a virtual event would need to be a special event. I think you actually need to come at it with a blank sheet of paper and actually think about what works digitally and in the virtual space and what therefore might be the best fit to your donors and your supporters. The other thing to really tap into is the fact that you can tap into your supporters expertise and help in testing so they are at home um it's a perfect opportunity actually to share some concepts get some zoom brainstorms gone get them actually having and looking at drop content get them if you're going to try and do for example a zoom quiz get them to do a dry run for you um it's a great way of engaging your supporters and as we know they they know whether something's going to work or not so really try to involve them as much as possible. But I would certainly have a look at it. I mean, agencies I particularly like, and I stress, I have no financial relationship with them. <laughs> um, I really like Plaspis Digital. I really like what Rally does. Um, so I think it's definitely worth asking around in the sector of who's worked with great digital agencies and who would they suggest. Right. Okay, so we are coming up to the hour, so we'll probably stop there. But if there's anything pressing that you guys need, um, then you can get in touch with to touch with um, Catherine or myself directly. Really big thank you to you, Catherine, for pulling together all these insights via these roundtables and then sharing this with with everyone. Um, as mentioned, we'll be circulating the slides and a summary email today. And um, then, if you're interested in receiving the video because you want to watch Catherine and I in your evening time as well as mornings, um, please please do uh, get in touch. Um, I will also send around the links to our upcoming webinar. So that one that I mentioned on building resilience, which will be really good for your team members. So do get them to um, log on to that. And um, in terms of, as Catherine mentioned, looking at doing skills audits or mapping skill gaps within your team, please don't hesitate to reach out and I can advise and, and talk through how we've seen organisations do that in the past. Similarly, I mentioned about the gaming introduction. If any of your charities are interested in that, let me know and I will facilitate an introduction. Um, and just in terms of peer-to-peer -peer introductions if you um, need anything or you want to branch out your network just let me know and I'll see how I can help and if you need anything in your fundraising team get in touch with Catherine she's a, she's a star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and thanks guys for your time for listening and all your helpful comments and things like that and as I said um, keep fundraising trust your supporters we will come through this as a sector we will fundraising will be will come through and will be come back stronger we will do this so um, there is there is hope and i know it's really tough and also make sure you look after yourselves fundraisers do tend to be quite resilient we do tend to be used to to knockbacks and difficult situations 
but this is tough right now particularly if you're some of the few fundraisers left on the deck with your other people being furloughed and it's tough for people being furloughed as well so do make sure you look after yourselves i think this is a two to three year period of us trying to come through this i don't think this is is going to be fixed overnight but we will come through it so um, make sure you're using plenty of biscuits tea coffee and gin yeah no completely i mean the sector the reason that i'm perhaps so passionate about the sector is the amount of talented people in here so you are capable of dealing with this change it's hard now but we will all we will all come through this so thank you everyone for joining us and um our feedback is really welcome as well if anything you think we can tweak and improve and um i will we'll say goodbye now thanks guys have a great day bye everyone bye